So today's purpose um, is really to just hear collective um, challenge or hear collective strategies that we are doing across the state um, as far as supporting post-secondary matriculation. I know that there are some counties that are doing, you know, calls to every student that's in the county. There are some that are um, organizing virtual ILP classes. There's some that are organizing Zoom calls to make sure they can help with FAFSAs. And so I thought this would be a really great forum so we can see what are people doing. Um, we all, I also want to make sure that we have a conversation about what is understand and understand your challenges and needs. What is happening right now on the ground? Um, what is it that's preventing you from um, talking and for, um, for supporting students? Um, and what are your needs to support those students? I can't make any promises that we can make them go away and that we can make them uh, make those needs uh, better, but I promise you that we are here to listen, um, and that's what I can offer right now. Um, and then also just to document and share some best practices as we, I am recording this also for my own benefit because I want to make sure that I am collecting and I'm hearing what is happening, um, and I'm hearing some of the strategies so that I can put them together um, into one nice sheet and send it out um, for anyone that may not be on the call or if we need to have um, other people to be sending out these resources too. Alrighty, so I'm going to start the conversation off by just giving some public uh, college admissions updates. Uh, the, again, all of the systems have provided some guidance as far as how they are currently handling freshman admissions at the time. I'm going to start with the UC system. So the UC system has temporarily suspended um, A through G letter grades. Um, that is for courses that are completed in the winter, the spring, and the summer of 2020. They are accepting pass, no pass. Okay? So I know that there are some districts that are still trying in school districts and um, counties that are deciding, do we do letter grades? Do we do pass, no pass? How does this affect their admissions? Um, right now, this is UCs and CSUs as well, which I'll talk about soon, are accepting pass, no pass grades um, for those A through G requirement schools, classes. Uh, so decisions have actually gone out. If you are working with students that are um, waiting for admissions decisions, the decisions have gone out for the UCs. Um, they have May 1st in to make their admissions decisions. There is flexibility though um, from campus to campus on if students can actually make that decision. Um, they, have, they have provided local guidance and local control to the actual UCs. So if you have a student that maybe they're going to UC Riverside um, and they're not able to make that admissions decision yet, maybe it's based on financial aid they have haven't finished yet, I would strongly, strongly encourage, please contact um, admissions before that student um, loses that admissions um, to that school. They'll be able to work with that student. And then finally, um, for the UCs, the final transcripts are due on July 1st. They recognize that schools may not be open still or there is limited capacity to process fi um, final transcripts if they're not on site. Um, if a school is unable to provide transcripts, final transcripts for their students, they need to notify the UC um, Office of President's Office at askuc at ucop.edu. Now, if you have a student that um, the school is able to provide the, the final transcripts, for some reason the, the student is unable to have final transcripts for a slew of reasons, um, then the UCs have asked that the, uh, the, the, the student and whoever is supporting the student to reach out to the school individually and to talk to the school. Um, but if you have a school that's unable to do final transcripts, they need to reach out to the UC system as soon as possible so they can uh, make sure that student doesn't get penalized. So for the CSUs, the California State University systems, again, there is a temporary suspension on A through G letter grade suspensions. Um, they are accepting pass, no pass. This is again for the winter, spring, and summer of 2020. Um, those students that are in the, that typically would start early start programs, so those are students that maybe they are um, trying to get into those college level English and math classes for the fall. Um, they're not actually holding, um, uh, they call it ES, ESP or early start the early start programs on the summer they have um, said that this summer the individual campuses can may provide some summer bridge programming um, but that's an individual campus and an individual program decision I know that there are some campus that are opting to do some virtual um, some what's a virtual uh, what is that a virtual classes and virtual summer bridge programs but um, there is, are no decisions as a whole of whether that's going to happen or not. So if you have a student who is interested in a summer program, maybe they're initially looking at a summer program, I would 
highly suggest making sure that you connect with the campus and see if that program is happening. And if it is, what is the alternative form that it's happening in? Just to make sure the students are safe. Um, they are going to be determining um, English and math placement based on multiple measures. Um, if you are familiar with the community college system, they do this as well. They're going to be using a combination of the students' transcripts, their grades, um, and some self-report as well to start placing students in English and math. Um, the final transcripts for the CSU system is going to be due on July 15th. They are accepting transcripts through fall 2020 though. Um, so if you again have campuses and schools that are closed and they can't provide transcripts, they're not gonna be rescinding any admissions right now due to um, not being able to provide final transcripts. Um, and they have actually said that they, in some cases can accept unofficial transcripts in lieu of final transcripts right now. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and then um, the intent to enroll in the housing deposits, um, the extensions are being considered. They haven't given actual guidance systems wide. It sounds like right now it's on an individual campus basis. Um, so I would again reach out to either admissions or the housing department to see um, where, when those um, extensions have been or just continue to look on those websites. Um, so for the California community colleges, I mean, fortunately they're open enrollment um, and so there's you know, we don't necessarily have to worry about grades. Um, there, they might, the individual campuses may delay the, delay the start of summer and fall. Um, that is a campus to campus decision. I know, for example, at Long Beach City College, I was on their website a couple days and they said that they were delaying the start by a week. So this could be a campus decision. Um, and you would want to make sure to check on those websites and make sure that um, the students have, are provided the right start dates. Um, they are doing post-secondary enrollment. They are still doing matriculation. It's going to be on a virtual or phone enrollment for all of the um, orientations, for meeting with counselors, for orientation, uh, and for financial aid processes. Um, so again, you know, making sure that students have access and trying to give them access to technology is even more important, right? So as we are trying to make sure that our students are getting enrolled into these spaces, especially because community colleges is where most of our students are going to go. Um, we want to make sure they are also providing virtual student services. So, you know, the Guardian Scholars programs are still happening. The Next Up programs are still operating. EOPS, TRIO, they have moved to an online platform. So these, there's no cancellation of services. They're still providing financial aid and they're still providing grants to students. Um, it's, this looks a little differently right now. Um, and then campuses are being encouraged to use telehealth for mental health appointments. Um, I know this is the camp, again, a campus is campus decision, but they are encouraged to still do um, telehealth mental health appointments. So those, that service is also available. All right. Um, and again, uh, I want, I will be sending out the guidance. Um, that's the actual like two pages of guidance that is coming from these systems. So if you didn't catch everything, it's completely okay. Um, I will be sending that out in a separate email. Alrighty, so um, I do know that there's some practices that are happening as far as, um, um, sorry, I was on a, I was gonna call a campus, college campuses yesterday, so my head is still in college campuses. Um, with counties that are providing services um, to make sure that they, that students and seniors are supported in post-secondary enrollment. Um, and so, do I have Fresno on the phone? Maybe Pam or Vanessa, is, are you on the call? I am. How are you? Hey, hello. Um, can you please share what you are doing to support your seniors right now in the county? Okay, well, we have a really strong co collaboration with our community colleges and our, our CSU. Um, right now, there hasn't been any um, gap or um, postponement of services. So we're doing exactly what we're doing, what we've been doing, you know, making sure that they're fully matriculated, um, all of our students. And we're, most of it is going to be over the phone, to be really honest, because a lot of our students don't have laptops or have the ability to do Zoom. We are encouraging all of our students to upload, if they do have a phone, to upload um, Zoom and Microsoft. Um, teams and our community colleges are also doing Zoom kind of a drop in waiting um, those appointments. So they're waiting and, and, and then once they're finished with them, they go ahead and, and um, finish their classes, a registration. Um, I think one of our challenges, I, I'm not seeing a lot of challenges. I think it's when our kids, we've also um, encouraged our students to upload. Um, the free scanning app. So if we do have to, they have to sign something or something that they have, or we can 
you know, drop something off on their doorstep along those lines. And of course, keeping our social distancing and along those lines. So it's not, we've always had, um, I think that we have, because of our collaboration, and we know that each time that we finish what we are doing, so the one additional thing that we're doing is the orientation, which we have a, an annual event, which of course, our extreme registration, which was canceled. So um, we've agreed to do the online orientation which, with each of our students and ensure that those are completed. So, and again, having the web grants, uh, you know, having access to that and knowing if they have their FAFSA completed has been, a game changer for us. I really appreciate the advocacy of getting that for us. Yeah, can you talk to us a little bit about what that free scanning app is? What, what is the name of it? Is it? I think it's free? Genie Scan, but there's some other ones that are, there's several of them. I think it's Genie Scan that I, I have used. And there was another one that a, um, another um, Ed Services Specialist told me about. Um, but that's really a great way to um, handle that. Excellent. And they're also saying, giving the email, and that's kind of a iffy thing. We're still exploring. Can you just send an email and say that you agree with it? That we would prefer to still have, you know, a, a document that is signed by that student. Yeah. Sam, could you walk through? So you mentioned that you're doing online orientations individually with students. Can you just walk through sort of what exactly does that consist of? What does that look like? Well, I know for our, like Fresno City College, which is one of our largest, we have three colleges. We have um, Fresno City College, we have Reedley College, and then we have a Clovis Community College. Uh, it's probably the orientation for all those um, colleges, because it's a district, it takes about 45 minutes. And I think it's probably more difficult than CSU or UC. Um, what exactly are you asking as for, Debbie, as for what does that look like? Well, I, mean, so I think we're just... Maybe I misunderstood what you're saying. So yeah, I know you said you canceled the extreme reg registration event. So you're saying the students are doing online orientation through the college. That's not something that you as the FYSCP are doing with them. We, if they're having any, actually we guide them because there's some, you know, especially in their foster, there's some questions that they have to answer a certain way. And so we guide them through that. So as they're on there, we might, they might be on their phone and still put us on speaker and we can walk them through and we, we go along with them on the laptop. And so we just ask them what page. We're not seeing the same screen uh, because they're on their phone, but at least we're having um, the ability to walk them through that. Does that make sense? Got it, yes, thank you. Yeah. If they have Zoom, then we can share that document. But typically they, I think they're getting more um, used to the Zoom and the ability to share documents. Okay, so you're sort of virtually sitting, sitting alongside them, walking through the process. Right. Yeah. Because we, and you know what? It, I'm going to tell you, oh, it is easier to do it one-on-one. -on -one. It just is for us because there's so many questions that our students have. But again, we have the capacity, you know, I mean, we have a lot of students, but we have six education services specialists that are out doing that. And a lot of, you know, programs don't have that capacity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Pam, for sharing that and sharing, you know, what you guys are doing. I think it's great. And you guys are always known as the powerhouse. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, do I have, um, I know that Melanie is on the phone. I know that Lisa's on the phone from Riverside County. Um, either of you can speak to what you are doing right now um, to support your seniors through the um, college enrollment process. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Um, so some information that I have and I prepared to share today is um, some general overall information um, to help lay the foundation to our districts and to our counselors of support services um, that are out there um, among the county, among the state. We really have been um, helping to distribute um, that information to our district foster youth liaisons as well as our school counselors. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment and I do have um, one of my colleagues, Eunice Miranda, who was also um, zoomed in and on the call. She's going to be sharing um, some, um, some 
um, resource web links and some flyers. Um, that way you just get a quick snapshot of what we have prefer, pro, um, provided, excuse me, to our districts and counselors, um, especially around, you know, this challenging time with uh, COVID-19. Some um, resources really speak specifically to um, foster youth during this time, um, COVID-19 and just additional um, support resources. Um, so firstly, I did want to say that we are working um, with, and we have been in conversation with Tia um, on behalf of the JBay team, um, hoping to learn if there's um, a possible additional funding that can be located for laptops for our K-12, um, for our K-12 students. Um, we also have been working with iFoster in regards to um, distribution of um, cell phones to our students age 13 to 26 years old, communicating with Sarita Fox on what that process is, um, helping to ensure that she is receiving the information on students that is requested. Um, our districts are communicating directly to Sarita Fox um, with that communication, um, pertinent information that they need. And then there's about three different phases um, that cell phones are being distributed that Sarita um, shared with me when I did, in, when I did inquire about a timeline. Um, I've asked districts to copy me on the districts that I support. I support nine different districts in our county of um, 23 districts. Um, so far, unfortunately, I haven't been copied on any emails from our districts um, to Sarita with um, the request for cell phone support and assistance. Um, I will be continuing to um, connect with my districts in regards to that and do some follow up work. Um, so, you know, really that the foundation of, of technology and access to technology so our seniors um, and all students can remain connected to their education you know, through through the pandemic, through this very challenging time. Um, it does look different with everybody in our districts as we are realizing some districts are in full force with distance learning implementation, while other districts are still um, working to get their plan in place and, um, and then proceed forward with it, helping to ensure that all their students have what they need to be successful. Um, our program coordinator and our office secretary have been working very closely together um, recently on purchasing school supplies. So it's not only um, distribution of cell phones um, to our youth, as well as hopefully, um, possibly we can receive some um, laptops, again, possibly through JBay um, and additional funders that may be found. Um, also, we are offering school supplies. The school supplies um, thank you, uh, Eunice, for um, getting the resources um, up there and ready to go. I'll be there in just one moment. Um, our school supplies right now, we are placing an order um, to reach and touch um, at least 600 of our foster children and youth. This definitely includes senior students as well. Um, that would be our first phase. And then we are hoping that after that distribution of um, supplies, excuse me, that we then can make um, further orders. So again, as the need is expressed and comes in to Riverside County, um, and I'm sorry, I'm with Riverside County Office of Education. I'm, I'm one of the counselors with uh, FYSCP program, excuse me. Um, we hope to have more phases of a res uh, the school supplies being distributed. So we are working very closely as a um, FYSCP team to um, coordinate these services, to come together as a team, prepare the school supply packages to the children and youth, and then we will be um, discussing a plan of how this will be distributed out to the actual districts. We are also, um, our program coordinator, Melanie Bridges, has also been in discussion with um, DP PSS as well in hopes that we can connect with social workers who are still um, on the front line making home visits um, to collaborate with them to leverage those services of distributing school supplies. Um, here you can see um, on the screen um, provided that these are resources that we have provided to our districts. Um, it talks about um, low cost, free Wi-Fi and data support um, of cell phones. Um, this coming from various um, agencies, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, um, Spectrum. There we go. So, and please know everyone that I will be providing the resources that we provide um, today and I'm discussing here to Tia. So that way she can then distribute out to everyone on the call. Um, should you like to reference this 
yourself and provide to your um, districts and uh, school sites if you um, feel that it would be a resource um, valuable to yourselves as well. Um, we also have provided the CDE news release from State Superintendent Tony Thirdman on new, new guidance for grading and graduation for seniors. So this information has gone out as well, again, using as a very valuable resource for um, our districts to refer to when they are looking at the implementation of their um, plan, especially around um, grading practices and uh, graduation for seniors as we move through the end of the school year. Um, we also have been in communication um, very frequently with our district liaisons, um, helping to learn, to understand, and again, Tia, thank you for posing this question. It really came from a question posed from Tia about what does it look like in our um, county and among our districts about school operations and school counselors. So we um, have learned that our school counselors are definitely working remotely, and they also do have access to their student information systems. So as certain student cases um, with our seniors um, and overall just our foster youth come up and there's technical support needed. We know that our school counselors are able to tap into their SIS system um, and to um, have access to transcripts and GPAs and GPA verification forms. Um, so we that is something that we've also been working on as well because again um, we're a large county and it could look a little bit um, different district to district to district. Um, one of the um, other resources that we have provided is the CDE COVID-19 trauma-informed care for foster youth, which includes additional resource links for teachers, educators, parents, and students, as well as we have provided the 211 resource flyer. Um, this was created from Community Connect. These are collaborative partners um, coming from um, DPSS, CalFresh, and United Way. We also have sent tips for self-care during COVID-19. Um, Tia referenced to us all how important it is to also ensure that we are taking care of ourselves um, through this challenging time. And so this is something for ourselves as well as a um, constant reminder to our districts and our um, county partners and school counselors about how important it is for self-care. Uh, during this time. So that has also been distributed out. Um, there is a Google link that we also have provided for students and for educators. And so this link as well, um, we will provide to UTS so it can be distributed out. Um, that way counties can access our Google link um, resource pages um, for educators and also for students, because as you may come across um, some very specific student needs and the resources here are um, cover a very wide um, facet of um, specific services that our foster youth may need. And, um, oh, one of my, our data technician is sharing that the Google link flyer um, also has um, been, been sent on here. Thank you, Riley. So again, um, please just know that what we are covering here, and I know it's very quickly, um, and I'm going to wrap up here. Um, Melanie, our program coordinator, may want to share um, some possible additional information. Um, so just know that will um, get out to you. We are checking in with our seniors um, constantly and our site counselors um, around graduation and what is graduation um, status looking like for our foster youth, as well as FAFSA. Um, our, one of our um, collaborative uh, county partners is Riverside Community College District, and I'm going to um, pass it to um, Chris Deck in just a moment, if first letting Melanie um, share anything additional. Um, but Chris Deck, he is the uh, program director for the Foster Youth Support Network, and we continue to work um, collaboratively and very closely with the RCCD district. Um, and so I know that Chris is planning to share today of what their resource specialists um, are, how they're staying connected with our students in the district that they've been supporting all year long in six of our districts. Um, so Melanie, um, over to you. Is there anything additional that you would like to share with everyone on the call? No, I think you covered it all. Great job, Lisa. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. All right, um, Chris, would you like to take the mic and 
share? Sure, sure. Thanks, Lisa and Melanie. Um, just a couple quick updates. We, it, just for context, our program actually places student resource specialists before all of this in uh, high schools to work directly with foster youth in one-on-one -on -one or in small groups to help them not only matriculate to college, but prepare for college with college and career assessments and planning and, and that type of thing, starting in ninth grade all the way through 12th grade. Um, so after you know all of the stay at home orders and now that everyone is at home, um, we are doing our best to leverage the technology that we have available to be able to continue to stay in touch with these students. I mean, at a base minimum, just trying to make sure that they feel connected still. Um, you know, productivity is gonna go down during this time. I don't think there's any way around it, but what we're doing our best to try to keep the, mo the, the momentum, uh, for lack of a better word, in terms of, for especially for seniors graduating and moving on. So our first initiative that we tried to do is uh, create dedicated Google Classrooms um, for each resource specialist that could then have their students that they work with, their caseload, join. It provides, you know, they'll be able to post updates, resources, all of the things that Lisa was just sharing um, that they can leverage. Um, and it also allows sort of for like a virtual gathering place and they can message each other, they can ask questions, we can help through that platform. And that has been somewhat successful, although we have run into some challenges in terms of some students are not able to access, you know, the Google Classroom to their student emails. We're trying to work through that and, and figure that out. Um, the other technological piece that we have in place and we have already had in place before this was um, our district customized the Salesforce database that connects with our college SIS. So basically what that means is anytime a FOSS youth applies to our college, our resource specialists are notified the next day by email and in their Salesforce dashboard. And that way we can immediately reach out to them and help them with the next steps of matriculation. And so that's been really helpful to have that in place because we've been able to continue sort of reaching out and knowing, and like I said, anytime FOSS youth applies from anywhere, not just our county, uh, we, can, we can help them through the process. Um, additionally, we're prepared to and, and you know, as, as we move closer to registration, which for us will be about mid-May, um, we're ready to host Zoom sessions um, and, and do walkthroughs for applications, financial aid, um, those types of things, just the rest of the matriculation process. Um, so that's what we've worked on so far. I just wanted to share that. I, if there's any of a, anyone from our team on and I missed anything, um, feel free to share, but otherwise that's my update. Okay, I think that that round us out for Riverside. Thank you so much. Um, I, I obviously I, I do a lot of work with Riverside, and I know that there is a really tight collaboration between the county offices and the college, and um, it's been you guys are wonderful. Um, and I hopefully you guys, those of you that are not in Riverside County have been able to um, grab some really good information. I mean, the fact that you're even using Google Classrooms for this, I didn't even think about that. That's a great idea. Um, and you know, if you're able to secure that, pro provide an MOU, even if you have um, privacy concerns. I think that's a really great idea. Um, so thank you, those of you. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing those really awesome resources. Um, I already got some messages that says, please give me that. <laughs> um, so that's awesome. I'm going to, yeah. oh yeah. Um, I recently learned that through Zoom, you can take over someone's computer. So that could potentially be an option if you Zoom with the student. Um, they can give you access to their desktop if they get stuck somewhere and you need to scroll around and move things. So it's an exciting but kind of scary feature that Zoom allows you to do that. But that's how I got my computer fixed at home. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do also, I mean, I, in school, they actually gave, I'm, I'm doing my master's in instructional design and they gave me a very robust um, Zoom, like, it's like a 10 page guide of Zoom. I could share that with everyone as well. I'm allowed to share that if people are like, they want a very, very detailed how to use Zoom. I believe that feature is also in there as well. I can share that too. I see a couple thumbs up. I love that people are using the little digital things. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I can share that as well. Thank you, Melanie, for sharing that. Um, and if anybody else has pro tips on all this technology, please share it. We all need them. Okay, so I am going to move us along. Again, thank you so much, Riverside. Is Karina on the phone from San Joaquin County? Hi, everyone. I'm here. 
Hello. Can you please share um, what you're doing um, in your county, specifically around what's happening with ILP? Okay. So for ILP, that has been my focus because our community college, San Joaquin Delta College, has been closed. We, as a team for ILP, got together and started to brainstorm how can we provide um, like virtual services to students. And initially, we tried Google Classroom. Um, I set it up through my my COE account, and unfortunately, it did not go through with the code and all of the students that we have within our district here at San Joaquin County. Um, some students weren't able to log on or staff that we were sharing the code with. I talked to our IT, our IT team to figure out what we needed to do. Um, it sounded like we needed to whitelist everybody's address, so we um, started to think about how else we can move forward, so we did a Zoom. So in planning for ILP, it was going to be Zoom. We contacted all our students um, that had been coming to ILP or everybody who had just registered for this school year. Um, and that was all by phone contact, reaching out to them, letting them know, are you interested? Is this something you want to do? And then taking down their email address. Um, we hosted our first Zoom ILP meeting last night and we had 15 kids. So that was pretty cool. We kind of, in just, we had set up like a schedule if we were to meet on campus, um, specific topics because that changed. Um, we were starting to ask the kids what did they want to hear from or how could we help meet their needs now with all the changes. Um, and of course it was basically um, job searching tips. Um, they were wanting to know or they wanted to know about how to apply to the community college um, so that's what we were focusing on. We started off last night Zoom meeting with um, a brief, what is COVID-19, taking care of yourself, focus on the positive, what is in our control, um, how we can all have, how we all play a part in um, doing what we can to stay home, to stay safe. Once we got that, we did like a student check-in, how are you coping with it? And then we talked about positive coping skills. And we went through some like senior reminders for our seniors keeping in contact with your school district that everyone's still available. They're working remotely. So you can contact them via phone or email or reach out to our FYSCP team to support you, which has been occurring. Um, and then we just started to focus on um, job skills, applications, resumes, cover letters. So we shared our screen with the students and walked them through that process. And then we also kind of just um, for next week's class, because we meet weekly. Um, so we have three more scheduled ILPs through Zoom. And so next week activity is going to be, show us what you've been doing. Because everybody's needs are different, um, whatever we presented last night, they had the option to pick and share next week. And then we have prizes. So we're collaborating with HSA and they're going to be, um, assisting with the prizes and those prizes can be refurbished laptops that we got gift cards just a variety of different things to meet their needs so that's what we that's what our focus has has been with ilp um, and if you have students that are um, that do need help with maybe the college applications or the fafsa um, what is how have you um, in your office been able to support that has it been through zoom has it been through the phone like what does that look like it's been a combination of both. So yes, we had a student um, asking about that last night. So after the meeting, any of the students that wanted to stay on, we shared the screen and walked through the Delta College admissions and then just were in contact. One of our ILP is Delta College staff. So she was supporting that student as well. Um, me personally, it's been kind of, um, as I'm making those phone contacts, finding out what their needs are, and either on the phone walking through that student with them and answering their questions or it's been through zoom to guide them through that process great thank you so much for sharing that i think that's a that's really great that ilp is still happening that it's you know that it's just moved to a different platform and I, i'm sure that you've probably seen more students contacting you now that they know that there is actually support and help out there for them thank you karina Alrighty, I'm going to move us to the next county here, um, and then I promise I will give other people an opportunity to share what they are doing and maybe some questions for those that are on the phone, um, and then that will lead us into the next part of our discussion. 
Um, and so uh, do I, I see Rosanna from San Mateo County. I see that you're smiling at me. <laughs> hey, uh, did you want to share, and if you have someone else from your team that is also, I, I don't remember if Steve is on the phone, um, what you guys are doing to make sure that you're supporting your students as well, your seniors uh, specifically. Yes, yeah, so um, we work, our program, the Foster Youth um, Coordinating Program works hand in hand with ILP and seniors transition. Um, from high school to college. And Steve Axberg, I do see his name somewhere on there, so I'm hoping he can jump in. Um, we had our first uh, tele teleconference on our seniors meeting, and so we try and meet two or three times a year to go over our seniors, look at their um, transcripts and credits, and um, identify supports they may need um, in their transition to the community college. So. Um, we had about four or five different providers, we, um, children and family services contracts with um, the Community Labor Council to provide ILP services, and they contract with Pivotal, Pivotal excuse me, to provide academic coaching for our high school students. So all of us were on the line talking about our, our seniors together. Um, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about how, how ILP is, is supporting our high school students? I don't know if he can unmute. Yeah, I think, uh, can, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Steve Axberg, San Mateo County. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the case managers with ILP. Um, as Rosanna mentioned, we work really close um, in contact with each other uh, regarding all of our students, uh, particularly our seniors. Um, from an ILP perspective, you know, pretty similar to what Karina mentioned, um, we're kind of giving Zoom a shot for our ILP workshops. Um, we had our first one last week. Uh, the intention of the first one isn't really with any kind of agenda other than let's just get youth there, um, see how they're doing, do you understand kind of what's going on in the world, um, how are you feeling about it, so pretty pretty general, um, just kind of, kind of created a space for them to, to talk about it, um, so that was our first meeting. Um, it wasn't heavily attended, there was only a handful of youth that actually participated. Um, they did say that they would be open to, to you know, doing that in the future, which is great. Um, Let's see, later this month, we're actually gonna be um, doing a virtual college tour. So we'll kind of see how that goes, where youth will you know, go online and explore different things about different colleges, and they'll have to check in with their individual um, ILP case manager regarding questions and you know, surveys and that kind of stuff. Um, we're still offering our ILP incentive for all of our ILP events, so they'll earn their 30 bucks you know, for, for participating. Um, but yeah, lastly, just you know, in regards to what Rosanna mentioned, um, all of our ILP case managers are checking in individually with our seniors, you know, regarding their FAFSA, their college applications. I think for the purposes of that kind of stuff, I think like Pam mentioned, I think we're having a lot more success in doing that kind of one-on-one. -on -one. So having individual phone calls with youth or texting stuff back and forth. Um, so that's kind of been our strategy so far. Nice. Can you share um, where are you doing those virtual uh, virtual college tours? Is there a website you're using? Is there? A, I know that there's multiple things that are out there right now. Is there something that you're using? Yeah. So, um, so our partners through um, the Central Council Label Partnership um, that Rosanna mentioned. So they kind of created um, basically a Zoom. They're going to do kind of a Zoom workshop regarding college. Um, just college material in general, but they're really just kind of directing students to individual college um, websites that offer the virtual tours already. So we're kind of taking advantage of those and then we've created kind of our own kind of quiz and things like that that the, the students can take afterwards. Nice, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. I've, I've worked personally with Steve and Rosanna for many years and I'm happy to be still continuing to work with them. So thank you so much for being here and sharing this. Thanks. All righty, I'm going to move on to, is Jessica from San Luis Obispo on the phone here? Do you happen to be here? Hi, I'm here. Yay. Can you share what um, you are doing with your seniors right now? Sure. We have two staff that regularly work with our seniors. Robin Kirby works with our Court and Community School seniors, and she meets with them regularly on a weekly basis. So she develops really strong relationships with those students. So she's continuing to call them. That's how she's in contact with them. And then we have Lisa Allardyce, who is uh, co-funded. I should say Robin is co-funded by Title I Part A. So she is a part of the Court and Community School team. Uh, so that's helpful for, for communication. And uh, 
Lisa works with all of our seniors that are not in court and community school, and she's co-funded through the ILP program. So she is um, both on the ILP team and on the FYS team, and she is also uh, co-located at Cuesta College, our local community college. So Lisa develops strong relationships with students because she's ILP co-funded. She maintains relationships all the way through grad school. So Lisa's on today. So I, since she's the one who has the relationship with the students, I'd, I'd rather she speak. So can I pass it on to Lisa? Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, so a couple things I wanted to share. Um, one of the challenges that I've had recently is the students that have been early grads that have graduated from either an out of county program and now are back. So there still are, you know, students for the year and students that have graduated from um, maybe a continuation school or a separate program. Uh, we're having some challenges getting them the Chromebooks. So our other students have, you know, this, the, our, we have like 10 plus districts here. So the districts have coordinated where our seniors have the Chromebooks and they each, like many of you have said, have their own programs and things are up online at different levels at different times. Um, it's been a bit of a logistical challenge to see who's on spring break, who had an extended time off due to um, our current challenge, but it's everybody is communicating super clearly. Our liaisons, our high school counselors, um, I'm in direct contact with the EOPS department and cafe center at Cuesta College, and they are still working exactly as they have. Fortunately, a lot of these things, a lot of um, aspects of our program have already been online. So we're used to that technology and we have that muscle memory. Um, we're contacting students one-on-one -on -one and um, teaching them how to complete things over their phone when they don't have the Chromebooks. And so being able to recall what their, um, what the screens look like and how to walk them through and we keep, we have an account log for, I, I keep an account log for students. So if they can't remember where they were at or if um, things were kept at the school site, we're able to give them those username and passwords to um, help them to log in, let them know where they're at. Um, also, I've realized personally that some of my students, um, when they completed the forms and applications, weren't really sure what they did. So at this point, things are really slowing down. They have the time to process, understand things more deeply. We have kind of a plan B in effect. Um, I'm using, uh, Jessica so kindly shared, the Search Institute, the building developmental relationships during the COVID-19 crisis. And so they have a checklist of how to approach a student, what the challenges may be. And um, if you guys haven't, don't have that, I think Jessica could share that with the team. Um, and it, at the same time, it, it provides connection, encouragement, but it, it really challenges them to stay connected in a healthy way by meeting them exactly where they're at and working with them from that point. Um, I'm also in touch with my uh, university students. Their GSP programs are still super vibrant. There's been some financial aid challenges with those students. Um, a lot of our students in this cycle are, be, are getting verifications for their, um, from the, through the FAFSA for um, financial aid. So they're like, wait a minute, I've never worked. How do I use this? 4506T form for, you know, through the IRS to validate that I haven't worked. So I'm mailing the students the forms, printing them off for them, addressing the envelope, giving them, them little post-its. So when they receive it, they can just sign and seal and get it off in the mail. So, you know, using everything that's available to us to 
just keep the flow moving and being available. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, the verification piece is always a challenge and you know, just to imagine dealing with this verification piece <laughs> remotely when things are running very slowly is a really good point that I anticipate Debbie and myself and the rest of the education team are gonna talk about after this call. Um, <laughs> so um, thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you, Jessica, for sharing. Um, at this point, um, we can do this one or two ways. Debbie, I'm gonna actually look at you for this. We can, one, I wanna provide you an opportunity for a couple of minutes, um, those of you that are on the phone, to ask anybody that had to, any clarifying questions um, that you, from the counties that are doing things. I also want to provide just some space of, if you're doing something, and this is specifically um, to address senior needs right now, um, please, I wanna give you a space and a time to share that right now. You can either share it in the chat box, um, just as I saw that Elizabeth has shared something from San, Santa Barbara County. Um, we are then going to move into a conversation about, and you know, Lisa, you actually just, you perfectly did this, um, and talking about your challenges right now, and maybe some potential solutions and I, at that point then I will pass it over to Debbie but right now um, is there anyone that has questions for anybody that has talked about what they're doing in their counties um, and anything that you would like to share that you are doing in your county or maybe something that you tried and you're like it didn't work but maybe it'll work for you and if you do use your little digital hand and then I will call on you or put in the chat box. Okay. All right, I think that everyone did such a great job explaining and we don't have any clarifying questions, which is great, or we're just all tired. I mean, let's be real, it could be that too. <laughs> um, okay, so at this point, I'm actually going to, Debbie, is it okay if I turn it over to you to start the next um, discussion piece? Yeah, and I think I'm gonna approach this a little bit differently than- Do it. You and I talked about to you. Um, so, uh, what I, we want to get a sense of what the challenges are that you all are facing right now, so that we can try to figure out if there's anything we can do about them. Basically, not saying that we necessarily uh, will be able to do something about every challenge, but we're going to, you know, do our best. Um, so. Some of these are gonna be more sort of practice issues, and then there may be some that actually uh, require sort of a policy solution. And I think as folks know, you know, that we're doing a, we always do a lot of policy work, that's kind of what we do. I wanna start with one uh, question in particular, which has to do with graduation. So, we were having an internal conversation about uh, what is going to happen with students and graduation for the seniors. So like if a student um, you know was on track to graduate but now can't participate in any sort of online learning for the spring term, like what's going to happen to them? And so the guidance that I read from CDE was not particularly instructive. It sort of gave well, it was guidance, it wasn't direction. It didn't say, here's what districts need to do around graduation, it sort of give more, here's some ideas and, and ways you can approach it. And so that prompted us to think, do we need to try to get something specific for foster youth? Because I don't think the state's gonna be issuing any blanket guidance that the districts are all gonna have to follow. I think it's gonna be very district by district, which means some of our students might be fine and others might not be, and therefore, uh, you know, we certainly have a precedent for having kind of special carve out rules for foster youth around, you know, SB 167216 and all the other things um, that exist specifically for foster youth. And so that is something we could potentially pursue. So I wanted to hear from folks about that question of graduation, anything you're hearing, any concerns that you have, um, any ideas that you might have for uh, a rule that we might want to propose, like anybody who was on track for graduation as of the fall, uh, who's a foster youth automatically graduates, or foster youth all get to graduate based on state standards rather than district standards. Uh, I, you know, I'm just kind of making things up, but 
any thoughts, you can either unmute yourself and talk or raise your hand or type in the chat. And I'm monitoring the participants, everyone. So I'm not sure if the silence is because people, it's just a big crowd and people are hesitant um, to speak or if that means this isn't an issue, graduation is all good, no problems, we can cross this thing off our list. Debbie, I think if you had some of the direct service providers on this call, you'd probably be flooded with questions. I know our alternative education program is working to figure out how to make it the best experience possible while students are graduating in a ceremony remotely. And Debbie, I am glad that you have posed this question about what does this look, for, look like for our foster youth. I did have that very same personally to myself as we have been, um, you know, peeling back the pieces to just all the different layers here with distance learning is, right, you know, what does happen with our senior foster youth if they have been on track to graduate this entire time and now due to this pandemic um, and maybe the, the lack of possible, um, say, te technology support or what have you, whatever those reasons could be so so do they not graduate you know are are they are they does this opportunity you know get taken away from them and do they you know so so i'm glad that you've posed that because i've had that very same internal thought to myself of what does this look like for those that were on track and were to graduate and now possibly may may not because of this Has anybody heard anything from districts about what they're planning to do with graduation? Like is, is the expectation that students complete and pass courses for the spring term just as they would need to otherwise? So what we're doing in our alternative education programs is um, if the students were passing at the quarter mark, um, then they will keep that grade. Um, any work that's done after the quarter mark, they're being given um, an opportunity to raise those grades. Uh, but we're doing a, you know, not holding the, or holding harmless the students um, so that they're able to just increase grades instead of lose anything at this point. And we're gonna issue the full five credits if they were passing. Hi, uh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Sorry, this is Marilyn from Santa Clara County. So we do have the Opportunity Youth Academy. And um, I actually, while you were guys were talking, I'll call Blanca, who is the admin for that program. And she said that all of the students in our Opportunity Youth Academy who are foster youth and all of the students, they're all working from home. So um, they are still planning to graduate students, but it won't be the normal graduation. So I just want, and that's where the majority of our foster youth in this county, they they go to OYA. Some of them go to do to the uh, traditional high schools, but the majority of our foster youth are in the Opportunity Youth Academy, and they are working from home. And so the expectation, just so I'm clear, is that they complete their spring classes. Yes, they're going to complete their their class. They're still working right now. The teachers are still working with them, but everything is online. I did. Uh, I saw that Helena had her hand up. Did you want to unmute yourself? Oh, I was just going to say that I don't, I think that the, the high schools here in Nevada County, they're working with all of our students. And um, I think that their intent is for everybody to be successful. Um, and so we really haven't seen anything yet. I think for, for us, we had school for a week and now we're on spring break. So I think as it kind of plays out a little bit and they see some of the hiccups that are happening, maybe um, we'll have more information on that. 
But we did, I have to say, we have a celebration. We did have one of our youth um, graduate um, yesterday from one of uh, from our um, one of our alternative high schools, and they put her in her cap and gown. They had given her all of her work until May, and she just pounded it out. She finished it, which I think will be really interesting for a lot of our kids that struggle with going to school and being in a classroom. Here, they're given this opportunity to. Um, to, to isolate, which unfortunately they kind of like to do sometimes, these kids. Um, she finished it. They put her in her cabin gown. She had a picture. It was pretty special. That's awesome. Um, I see a couple of things in the chat. Humboldt is saying that they've heard that the students are on track, they will graduate uh, from the Humboldt County Office of Ed Court and Community Schools. Uh, sounds like San Francisco is having a meeting this week to talk about this issue. Um, uh, I also see uh, Riley, if you wanted to share. Yeah, so I think that's kind of transitioning to a different question, which is uh, somebody else posted on the chat a minute ago around the issue of celebrating uh, graduates. Um, but before I transition into that, I mean, what I'm hearing is there's just there's not a lot of clarity. Um, there, there's a few places that sounds like have kind of created rules that if students were on track to graduate prior to the crisis, that they're gonna go ahead and graduate them regardless of whether or not they complete the spring term successfully. Other places, at least Santa Clara, are saying that they do need to complete the spring term, at least at this one particular school. Um, why don't we do a quick, uh, maybe we can do a, like a raise your hand poll really quick. Um, Tia, can you sort of manage the logistics of that as I pose the question? Um, so my question is, would you want to see a state policy that says for any foster youth who's enrolled in high school, if they were on track to graduate prior to the crisis, they graduate regardless of whether or not they successfully complete the spring term? Just yes or no, good idea or bad idea. Well, I'm seeing seven yet, no no's yet, although a lot of people either aren't voting or I'm not seeing them show up yet. All right, well, I'm not seeing any opposition and it looks like I'm seeing quite a few people saying yes. And feel free, um, you know, if you wanna email me offline, if you have thoughts that you're not comfortable sharing here, you can definitely do that at any time, debbie at jbay.org. Um, all right, so then somebody else raised the question of celebration and how do we, celebrate graduates um, given the social distancing rules. So Riley posted one idea. Uh, one local high school is asking students to send in photos so they can on honor the seniors on social media. They also made lawn signs stating that a proud family member of a 2019 high school and then high school name graduate. Uh, so that's a great idea. Any other ideas people want to share about celebrating? Skywriting. <laughs> and you got that in your budget? <laughs> oh, Kim, I see your hand up. I just unmuted you. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> oh. Hi, everyone. I actually didn't mean to raise my hand, but I was writing something, um, just a little small thing in Santa Cruz County. They are surveying parents and caregivers just to see what their preference would be for some kind of alternative 
form of graduation celebration. So that's where we're at, is just far as being open to definitely celebrating, but in some kind of virtual format or, um, so it's all TBD, but I like the idea that they're consulting with families as far as what their preference would be. I have another question for you all, um, which is in terms of getting technology to students, and I know this has been a big challenge, but where a district does have the capacity and is providing Chromebooks or something, one of the thoughts that I've had is, how is this going to work for foster youth in particular, and who are they, how are they connecting with those families, and are they connecting? Because if you're living with your parents, then presumably the school district is emailing or calling or whatever, reaching out to the parent to say, we have a Chromebook for your child. Whereas if you're in an STRTP or, uh, you know, um, maybe you've changed placements and the school doesn't, doesn't know who your caregiver is today. And like, are you guys doing anything? Is anybody doing anything to kind of reach out to districts to make sure that foster youth aren't uh, falling through the cracks in particular on some of these issues, just given the unique kind of home settings. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. So um, ours here in Monterey County, what we're doing is we're going through either the social workers or through their um, district liaisons. And we've actually had some of the social workers um, request some of the Chromebooks already. That's great. So you're asking, you're kind of saying here, these are the students either on your caseload or in your district please take responsibility for making sure that they're getting access to a Chromebook. Yes, and we have um, Chromebooks, so we have a um, loaner sheet and basically they fill it out and then um, we get the Chromebooks to them. One of the things we'll also send out just in case people don't have um, in the follow-up email is the link to iFosters free cell phone program. So if you can't get a student a Chromebook, you can at least get them a free cell phone if they're 13 or above. Those cell phones, they are smartphones and they come with an unlimited data plan. Uh, Susanna, who I believe is from San Francisco, if I remember correctly, says, uh, we are working with our district's IT program to figure out who has received a Chromebook be able to reach out to those who do not after this week. All high schools are getting Chromebook access. So great, so it sounds like the, the district is providing the Chromebooks and so you're working directly with the district um, to flag the foster youth and make sure that they're not missing out on that. So I just want to kind of open it up. We have a few minutes left. You know, we're focusing on college matriculation and high school graduation, but we're keenly aware that you guys are dealing with a lot of different stuff right now beyond just this. And so since there's so many of you participating, if you have any other issues that you want to bring up, pose to us, pose to your peers, um, we want to kind of open this up for you all to do that. Lisa, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, what I'm finding is um, some of our seniors had, although they'd completed, you know, the FAFSA and the Chafee grant and they were moving towards graduation and possibly considering college, now that many of them, if not all, have been laid off and no longer are working, they're really starting to consider college as their plan, a, plan B, maybe even plan A. 
So I think there's an opportunity to have those conversations now. And it's, you know, timing is everything. So as things slow down and they actually have an opportunity to, to think and reflect and kind of decide, what do I want to do? Um, that's kind of, I think we have an opportunity there that we may have not had in the past in a really positive way. So just tossing that out there. So I'm sorry, just so I'm clear. So you're saying students who may not have thought about college before are now sort of realizing given how tight the job market is going to be upon graduation, that college actually be a more viable option right now. Absolutely. And the really it's now what I found with, with the students I'm working with is they're listening to what that financial aid is, where it's coming from. It's making more sense. It's landing in a way that it hasn't landed before. Mm -hmm. And so giving them the proportions, if you take six units, if you take 12, you know, what does that look like? And you'll have some income consider this your new job. So I think it's a different way to present and to highlight it. And they don't have to know what they want to do. In, in so many of these applications, it's what's your major? What do you want to do? You know, what's your field? And they've actually said now, it's like, I didn't do this because I don't know what I want to do. You know, I'm so confused. And now I'm super confused because I have no idea what the future looks like. And so get to start at the beginning you get to take two classes so we're having um we're having new and positive conversations that the opportunity wasn't there before so i'm super excited that's great and you did just remind me of something which i know you all know this but i'm going to say it anyway um you know financial aid, FAFSA, even though the March 2nd deadline is passed and a lot of people focus on the March 2nd deadline, it's absolutely not too late to do a FAFSA um, for our false youth in particular. You know, the Pell Grant is available anytime. Chafee Grant is available anytime. Um, you know, it's, it's limited and you might get put on a wait list, but there's no, there's no cutoff date for doing an application. For Cal Grant, foster youth have a special deadline of September 2nd, so they can continue to submit a FAFSA and qualify for, um, for the Cal Grant, you know, work study is still available, all of those federal programs. So uh, absolutely continue to do those FAFSAs. Uh, Tia, do you want to just share really quickly um, where we stand as of our March 2nd deadline as a state for the FAFSA completion? I think it's really yeah. exciting. Yeah, I think it's really exciting and I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, so we as a state, and I will know that there are a couple counties who have not reported and this is not to shame you. Um, as a state though, we have the majority of very large counties and medium counties that are reported. We're at about 59%, 60% completion of FAFSAs across the state, which if you remember this time last year, we were at about 45% this time last year. Um, so like clearly you guys are doing amazing work. So like students are doing FAFSAs, we're clearly seeing a move. Um, and you know, those of you that I like see some hand claps in the, in there. Um, uh, yeah, like seriously round of applause. Like I, when I was doing the numbers, I was like, that is insane that like there's, I'm just excited. I'm excited that there's all these students that will have access to financial aid. And thank you, Lisa, for bringing up that, you know, now they're realizing, oh, this may actually be the option for me. Um, and so uh, reframing this conversation, and I think that students are actually going to be more susceptible to doing FAFSAs now. Um, and even if this is not exactly the most exciting process for them, um, you know, I think that they're now going to see the actual impact of it. So like, Great job, everyone. I'm excited. Uh, if you have not reported your numbers to me, uh, please, you know, I'll, I'll resend a reporting form if it's okay. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for the amazing work that you have done. Some of you have, I have had Zoom calls, sometimes back-to-back -back Zoom calls about web grants and CSAC. And it's, it's clear that we, you guys are moving the needle in a very large way. Um, I see Deborah's hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. okay. Hi, good morning. Hello. Um, I was curious about whether we could get more real time and tangible information about Job Corps and ways to support students who might be considering that as a real option now or need some logistical help to, to consider that as an option. You know, because not every region is as close to an actual program as others. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Debbie, you have anything. We could certainly find out, I'm sure. I don't know if you have anything, Debbie. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with Job Corps, but I think it's something that we can look into and maybe see if we can find somebody to uh, do a presentation or share info on a future call. I'm sure they'd be happy to do that, I imagine. Thank you, I'd appreciate that. And I'd also appreciate hearing from colleagues about in other areas about their experience with supporting students to access it. Mm -hmm. At a, you know, at a later time. Yeah. Yeah, we will definitely get back to you. I, I know virtually nothing about Job Corps, but I can, I can definitely read up on it and we'll definitely try to find some resources. I do also want to make sure that um, there's also paid apprenticeship programs. Uh, maybe that there's some students that are still, they, paid apprenticeship programs are essentially paid internships. Uh, many of them are leading to union cards um, and they're in multiple trades programs um, and they are usually centralized to um, the industry in that area. If you're not um, familiar with those or uh, if you don't know where to actually find those, uh, I could actually, I'll also share that link as well for um, if you wanted to help students to find paid apprenticeship programs. Um, I will say that it is, it is a state funded program. Um, so obviously things change. They are generally in person. So those could look different, but paid apprenticeship programs are still an option, um, even if the actual training looks a little different going into the fall. And Tia, just to put a plug in for Job Corps, as I understand it from my limited experience, it's a federally funded program that provides room and board and education and apprenticeship connections and students can finish their high school diploma and complete a course of study mm. so it's really good to know thank you deborah i did not know that and i'm really gonna have to read up on it <laughs> i just saw somebody uh, asked in the chat any update on i foster program so um the i foster uh smartphone program continues to be available they have quite a lot of smartphones available, so we're not anticipating that those are gonna run out anytime soon. And, uh, I can try. well, I'll just have Tia send the link out afterward. There, there's a link for how a, a student would fill out a form in order to request one of those smartphones. They do have to be 13 years or older. That's the California Public Utilities Commission rule. As far as um, laptops or Chromebooks, at this point, what I Foster decided to do is prioritize college students for laptop access or Chromebook access, because we know that those, those students, or those courses all went online very quickly. And we didn't, you know, students who didn't have access and couldn't access their coursework quickly were at high, high risk of dropping out of school. And we know that if we lose these students now, then now, the likelihood that they're ever going to come back goes down. So Chromebooks are being prioritized for college students. We have a grant request in right now to a foundation to try to get additional funding to be able to expand the Chromebook program. I have no idea whether they're going to fund us or not. Quite frankly, I'd, I'd give it sort of a 50-50 chance. Um, if we get those funds, then that would potentially allow us to open that up and provide Chromebooks uh, to high school students. But we won't know about that. They said they won't be notifying us until April 17th, which is kind of annoying. We're like, yeah, well, <laughs> classes are happening now. Um, but, you know, until we find a funding source, uh, that's the limit. We, I Foster has sort of been relying on us primarily to raise the money for that. Uh, Chromebook program. So we're continuing to try to find resources. Um, and yes, uh, the question, will that include hotspots with the Chromebooks? Yes, anybody who gets a Chromebook, iFoster is automatic, automatically sending them the smartphone. And those smartphones have unlimited data plans, which means they can be used as a hotspot for Wi-Fi access and the student will not have to worry about, you know, maxing out or being 
charge. And again, those they can get today. So if they don't have smartphone access, make that request to iFoster because they can absolutely get that. The Chromebooks is the piece where we actually have to pay for them. Um, we can't get them for free. And so it's a little challenging. Um, so I think we're kind of getting towards time. Um, I see Marilyn, you sent a question. Of what about MOUs? I'm not sure I understand the question. I foster, so, I foster MOUs, the uh, internship program. Is that a AmeriCorps program? program? Sorry, the AmeriCorps program? Yes. And okay. um, so a lot of the job sites that they had been using for the AmeriCorps program closed. So I don't think that they're taking new AmeriCorps volunteers. What they did with their AmeriCorps volunteers who were at other sites is they repurposed them to process uh, cell phone requests for iFoster because they're getting thousands. And so all of those AmeriCorps volunteers are now um, processing cell phone requests, which is great that they were able to continue to uh, provide them with meaningful opportunities. Um, but a lot of the sites are nonprofit organizations and things that have, you know, moved online. So I don't think they're expanding that program, but they're doing what they can to try to keep those that are already participating uh, to have access to, to uh, activities. So I'm going to just ask one final question before we sign off, which is um, whether this was helpful and whether this is something that you would want us to do again, um, you know, maybe sort of picking some different topics to focus on giving you all an opportunity to share each other. So why don't we vote? I can create a quick poll. <clears throat> or actually just raise your digital hand. I saw yes very much. You can also just post in the chat box. See yes. Wanna check? No? Okay, so it seems like the a good majority are happy with it. Okay, good. Not seeing any no's, although people probably wouldn't vote no, even if they did. <laughs> if anyway. Um, There's nothing, then we assume no. <laughs> um, well, good. I know in this time of, you know, everybody's working remotely, and I do think opportunities to connect are really important. So we're glad that you found this useful. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Tia, for any closing remarks. Yeah, no, um, I just wanted to thank you so much again, everyone for being here. Um, I have gotten a couple of questions uh, through privately asking if this is being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded. We are going to share out the presentation. Um, we are going to be gathering the ideas uh, as well. So thank you, um, Pam, for making sure that um, that was on my radar as well. And there are many resources that were shared um, from the counties that I will make sure to gather from them and to share out to everyone. Um, as usual, please continue to reach out to me, um, even if you need a thought partner. I've had many great conversations. Honestly, I feel like some of our relationships are stronger now because of this. So I get a lot of like, just I just need to think. Um, so please continue to do that. Um, I, a lot of times just sitting in isolation with our own thoughts is really daunting. And if you just need to sit on a Zoom call with someone just to see a face, like please reach out to me. I'm happy to sit there and talk through something with you. Um, and if you are having, um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate everyone, and you know, I love this community. So thank you for joining us.